you. Uh, well, I hear you, John. I don't see you. But yeah, let me turn the camera on. I'll find it here somewhere. It's down at the lower. Yeah, I got left. it. I think I, I think I might have clicked on the wrong link before. Sorry about that. We're, we're away. We're away. Uh, I think I'll get rolling. And if um, yeah, I remember at the last thing I should have talked talk to him. Tom Flynn had problem. I was I was going to remind him of the call in number. And I don't, I don't know about, uh, about uh, Jim, but we're here and we're away. Right. I would like to slightly modify the agenda. We had talked uh, by email several times about a letter having to do with Hawes Pond, a letter to um, uh, DRC. Um, But we haven't had a formal vote, and I would like to have a formal vote on that to approve the letter that we are uh, sending about Hawes Pond. Those of you who've forgotten, Hawes Pond is at the uh, easternmost end of Duck Creek. It used to be partially tidal. It was cut off about five years ago. We want to uh, restart it. So may I have a motion? We, we sort of had a mail vote. On that. Yeah. Everybody did. Yeah. Okay, I'll make a motion. All right. Second? I'll second it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All in favor? We I think we have four of us. Yes. Okay. Yes. John, would you do me a favor? Could you send me a blank uh, Town of Wellfleet um, letterhead? Oh, sure. And... Um, the other thing I have to do is there had been some talk that this letter would go uh, in connection with um, something from the Conservation Commission and something from the Select Board. So I'll have to see if that's still a plan. Um, apart from that, the agenda is as it stands. Are there any other changes or corrections? And the first thing is we have a, um, uh, s some minutes. We had a meeting of uh, October, not October, August 26th. Uh, we've not approved the, the minutes. They were sent around. Um, are there any changes or uh, <clears throat> corrections that people want to make? Just I'd move that we accept the minutes as recorded. Uh, I like people who take charge of things. I'll second that. Second? I'll second it. In favor? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm surrounded by paper here, so I'm trying I'm trying to keep things clear. The the other um, Thing I would like to do is to, uh, it wasn't formal meetings, but uh, on September the 16th, we, we did have a, what I thought it was a very useful uh, discussion with the Shellfish Advisory Board. And there were only three of us, Laura, John Duane, and myself. So we can't call them formal meetings, um, but there, there, were, there were notes which I um, circulated. And I would, uh, would either Laura or John, did you see any changes that you wanted to make in those notes? All right, so I, um, I believe that Tom from the Shellfish Advisory Board sent around notes too. Are they different or? His notes are official because they had a forum. They had a quorum. Okay. And, well, and I, I miss seeing those, John, so I'd have to look at them and see if I have any comments. Oh, okay. So, all right. So if no one sees any, any comments about my notes, um, We'll just call these official notes, not minutes. Um, and I will look out for Tom's um, 
official minutes. Yeah, well, I don't think they're official yet. We have. I yeah, vote. they haven't been voted. Yeah, yeah so I think we're we going to vote on it this week, perhaps. We would have to comment to, to Tom. So, one thing I did notice, I was looking at, at what's now official, unofficial notes from this September the 16th. I also pulled up uh, the notes from the meeting we had last November with the Shellfish Advisory Board. And it seems to, it seems to me that those are useful notes. And if we put those notes together, we've got a, a pretty good start on what the chapter on shellfishing should be for our um, uh, harbor management plan. But we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, Let's talk about the harbor management plan. Uh, there are three chapters um, in draft, um, three chapters not in draft, but I think they're actually not complicated chapters to get into draft. So I'd like to go through the ones which are in draft and see if there are any comments about those and um, based on those comments uh, I'll take uh, responsibility to um, put them in some sort of a final form. The first uh, set of, of draft is, is actually two pieces. One is um, sets the framework for this harbor management plan by saying that we think the harbor is not is in pretty good shape, and there's a number of activities going on which need need to be completed about nitrogen, the Herring River, Mayo Creek, and um, harbor harbor dredging, which which actually means alternatives to harbor dredging. No, no, sorry, that is harbor dredging. That's ongoing, and that that actually has started the first of October. And then the second chapter simply talks about the, the chapters, climate change, the Curley Report, uh, after dredging, shell fishing, and coastal access. Did everyone have a chance to, to, to look at those, that initial, uh, that initial introduction, and are there co any comments? Uh, through it right now. I'm just trying to look at this on two screens here. <laughs> I I read through it. it. It looked fine to me. I you know if I had any comments, I I emailed them to you. But I I think I'm okay with it. Okay. Um, without thinking mm. necessarily the details. Um, I think I should em emphasize a difference between this plan and the two that came before. The two that came before put a lot of effort into, into background, talking about the harbor, talking about um, how, how many acres of salt marsh we have, how many acres of shellfishing ground we have. Very useful. I would propose that we refer back to those and some other other documents. What we had agreed to and I think is the right thing is a fairly short document which looks very much at a plan for the next day. What do we need to do and assumes that the background is pretty much in people's minds. So if we're still happy with that then um, I'll just look for comments on these two first parts and um, push ahead and put it into a, a final form. I thought they looked pretty good, John. Yeah. And I apologize, we're not farther along with the shellfish thing. I have a, I have a plan in mind to, to get that. I don't think it's that going to be that complicated, Laura, and, and um, because of those notes that I referred to. Okay, well, we'll we can try and wish them all into a chapter. Okay. John D., if you don't mind sending me that doc you had. Uh, okay. 
let's let's wait till we get get to those docs and we'll talk about the plan going forward. So basically, the HMP uh, one and two are at parts one and two of the introduction are okay. Um, climate change. Uh, I had, this was not a difficult chapter to write, but it was difficult to sort of fit into the flow of the plan. Uh, the, the, the problem is that climate change affects uh, lots of things in the harbor. Um, it, it has direct effect on shell fishing, it has direct effect on the shoreline, it has direct effect on the marshes. So w one of the things we'll have to look as we look at the final flow is to be sure that the reader understands that there are, there are a number of consequences. Um, there's a fair bit of information on sea level rise predictions. I sent you one <coughs> set of graphs from uh, NOAA and pointed out that Based on that graph, the critical points are that between, for the next 10 years, we're, we're, we're only going to see a gradual change in harbor sea level. But starting from about 2030 or there on, it could become, start becoming quite dramatic. And I found another source from the, I think from the Conservation Commission, not the Conservation Commission, um, Cape Cod Commission, which showed the same conclusion. So we have some time to get ready. Uh, the important thing is um, that we don't waste any of the time. Uh, Steve Smith at the uh, seashore has been working on this actually for the past 10 years, um, measuring elevations of salt marshes. And he, he considered how salt marshes would react to um, climate change, both in terms of vegetation and their ability to push inland. Um, so the, the, those are those are important uh, recommendations, or or I should say background. Um, the the place, well, there, um, there are shell fishing consequences because it's going to be harder for shell fishermen get out to their their grants if the if the sea level is is risen. But in terms of salt marshes, the, the place that most intrigues me and worries me are the salt marshes on Lieutenant Island. If you think about those salt marshes, they, they're very exposed and they have nothing behind them. They have, they have nowhere to move into. And uh, we know the tides there can be high. I have, I have kayaked up and down the road across the bridge on, on <laughs> Lieutenant Island with, with about two feet of water. And that was several years ago, obviously at a very high tide. So um, I had the idea that I would contact Gordon Peabody and see if he had any ideas about protecting salt marshes. We've, we've talked about thin layer deposition I think something like that is the right way to go. I think we need monitoring both of the salt marsh elevations and shorelines. Uh, but Gordon has some pretty good ideas about how to protect um, uh, various uh, shoreline habitats. Um, does anyone have any other, any comments at all about this this chapter, um, maybe not so much in detail, but in the in the in the broad context of what we've been talking about. Uh, John, are you going to have uh, specific recommendations on this, or am I, uh, you know, like one, two, three, or whatever? That's one of the reasons I want to. I want to go to Gordon. My, my initial thinking, Tom, was, well, we've got 10 years and all, all we have to do is call attention 
to the problem and call attention to some of the yeah. concepts. Um, I would like to be a little more specific than that. And, I, and I, I'm, I'm hoping Gordon can help. I, I, th I think what we need, this is, my, this is a, a personal opinion. I think what we need down at um, offshore of uh, uh, Lieutenant Island is some sort of um, tidal, not tidal barrier, breakwater barrier, oyster, oyster, oyster reef um, that would, uh, and, and, and somehow that we, I'd, my concept is that that only breaks the wave action, which I think we will need, but it could, it could be designed as a feed for um, sediments that would go, that would be, the tide would take onto the, onto the marsh and help build the marsh up. Um, that's very, very loose in my mind right now, but uh, uh, I, that's why I'm curious to, to talk to Gordon and see if he has any thoughts. I hear people talking about the problem all the time. I don't see a whole bunch of solutions. Is there any place on the Cape that's taken action like that, John? Not that I know of. Uh, yeah. But that's a good question. I'll, I'll, uh, the, the person who, besides Gordon who might know the most about that would be Joanne Yamamoto at APCC because she she mm. does a very good job of keeping. So I will I'll make a note that besides Gordon, I need to talk to Joanne. Hey, John, not to jump around the agenda at all, but uh, that Gordon was somebody who, this is regarding the Curly Report follow-up, that was the name I was trying to come up with. Uh, Laura and I were speaking about the shellfishing chapter and about Curly in general, and uh, I don't know what his firm does. He's a consultant. So... Maybe kind of a one could, one person consultant. <laughs> yeah, gonna... maybe he could recommend because we're, I'm not getting too far with Center for Coastal Studies right now, and maybe he could recommend an alternative to okay. somebody that would do a harbor study. Okay. So while you're speaking with him, because I don't I don't know him, it seems like you you have a relationship. I only have seen him on and off in the past few years uh, when the Herring River project started, John, there was a technical team, the Herring River technical team, um, technical committee, and um, Gordon was the chairman of that and I was on it. So we, mm. we worked together for two or three years to prepare the, the basic plan for the Herring River restoration, which is, which is, is, is well on the way to implementation, knock on wood, uh, we mm. hope. <laughs> so, um, well, he's probably a good resource for uh, a contact regarding the harbor anyways. So I guess, again, my view is that the, 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 cha the basic chapter is okay, but it, it's, a bit, um, it's a bit loose. I'd like, I'd like to, to flesh it out a bit. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other comments? I'll just say thanks for all your work on that. Oh, that's fun. I enjoy doing it. Good. I do think if we could come up with a couple manageable recommendations, it would be huge because otherwise I think we'll just read it and go, oh yeah, that is a problem and yeah. nothing will happen. Somewhere, Laura, in something, let's, something I wrote, I, I, I remembered that the three, three towns on the Outer Cape, uh, Provincetown, um, True. And Wellfleet yeah. are, are doing um, shore, uh, shoreline protection study. Right. Uh, and Hillary is our key representative. And my reaction as a recommendation to the board, to the select board is let's see what they do. And then we need a, we need a, a climate change committee because there's going to be all kinds of things going on. If you start thinking about sea level rise, and we're talking about salt marshes, but some people are looking at their houses and roads. Mm. So um, 
we're talking about the harbor, but people's septics are going to be affected because right. because groundwater is going to go up. So, so there's if we respond to this climate change threat, there's there's a lot going to be a lot of balls in the air, and there needs to be a group that kind of oversees it all on, on behalf of the town. So that's maybe about as good a recommendation as we can make now, because a We've lot of the science is unclear still. Isn't there, John, isn't there a, uh, a group, a uh, climate change group that is now meeting regularly or, or not? I thought there was in the town. I'll, I'll, I'll double check on that again, Tom. Um, the last time I looked, they're more concerned with um, reducing our uh, our footprint. Carbon. Okay. Our carbon yeah. footprint. Yeah. No, no um, it's a fair question. I'll go look at the, I'll go look at their charter again. Um, um, that's a concern I have if, if that's still the case. And it's why I'm thinking about this new committee. Lots of people are like that. I, you know, I work closely with a lot of people at Mass Audubon and there's, they're still on that pretty much on that focus. Let's get our carbon footprint down, which is great, but we've got a big gorilla, in my view, coming up behind us and we need to, mm -hmm. we need to call attention to that. Right. Um, the, if I'm right, Tom, this, this group in Wellfleet has, has done a fantastic job as as a group at Mass Audubon and getting the carbon footprint down. But in terms of maybe we should maybe we should fit this into the into the into our introduction. We can we can talk about that. In terms of the big picture, all of the work that we've done in Mass Audubon, all of the work that we've done in Wellfleet is overridden if the automobile gas mileage standards are changed by a tenth of a mile per gallon. In other words, this, we've got to figure out how to leverage our work into something which is Cape-wide, statewide, countrywide, internationally, if, we're going, if it's going to be effective. That's just my view. You can, you can throw grenades at that as you want, but uh, that's my concern well, yeah, about the programs. I mean, it's great to have an electric car and, and that kind of stuff uh, as an individual uh, and, and every little bit counts, but it's really the big picture of, you know, what the community does, what the state does, what the nation, what the world <laughs> does, right. you know. And <clears throat> it seems like there's macro and micro that we're talking about, though. As John says, there's the whole world. Right. That then. They're the specific ones that you're worried about, John. Like what happens to the marshes? So these are these are these are consequences. And but right, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just I was just thinking out loud in terms of immediate steps for Wellfleet. Are those some? Should we at least highlight? We think the committee should be formed to keep track of this once the shoreline thing is done, and these are the three things that we think are, right. at this time, most critical, like the salt marshes, the impact on shell fishing. Um, well, I'll, I'll be sure to, to, to check and, and look at what this climate committee has done. I, as I say, they're, they, they've, I know they've done a fantastic job on reducing the, the carbon footprint throughout the town of Wellfleet, which actually is gonna save the town mm -hmm. some money you, if you've been up to the to the transfer station lately, you've seen all the solar panels. That's terrific. Yeah. But yeah. that uh, we can feel proud of it. But that doesn't stop that doesn't stop the larger issue. Well, somewhere along the way, uh, people were talking about oyster reefs. Just. Uh, you know, I was speaking with Nancy, uh, the shellfish constable, the other day, and she was telling me about the 
huge amounts of cults they've got coming in. And it seems to me there's got to be somebody somewhere that's actually built oyster reefs. Somewhere in town, there could be a way to use an oyster reef to help mitigate storm surges and sea level rise in addition to benefiting the shellfish population. So that would be one suggestion of something to do. Gear the shellfishing community or the shellfish department into building a reef somewhere. When we get to the chapter on shellfishing, the, once we get a draft, one of the first things I do is send it to Nancy and C and uh, we'll say something about oyster reefs in it. Uh, be sure of that and then we can see what her re her reaction is mm -hmm. because it, to me an oyster reef not only propagates oysters but because it's a reef it has other benefits for the shoreline uh, so I'm trying tracks to kill two birds with one stone so to speak track fish too um, well the uh, Audubon uh, did uh, some research in that here a few years ago and, and I think they thought that it hadn't worked but then you know there was some discussion I think maybe at the state of the harbor conference that some of those uh, blocks were down there were just covered with oysters so I, I I don't know do you know about that John I mean yeah, I, think I, I know a little bit of they, Go ahead, John. my understanding was is that they got covered with sand I mean I think it was maybe uh, that not to comment on the, the work, but they maybe didn't use enough of a structure or, it, it, you know, the shifting sands in the harbor were a problem. And I think that every time they tried something yeah. like that, I believe they just got covered over. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was my reaction to it. The oysters, were, the oysters loved it, but the sand, um, particularly over winters when you get, when you get some big, waves and storms in the harbor that they, they, they covered it. So um, not, trivial, not trivial to design an oyster reef for shoreline protection or to figure out where to locate it. Um, uh, easy, easy to recommend, hard to do. Yes. If we move on to the Next chapter on dredging, or what I think we should call after dredging, because it's not really about dredging, it's what we do when the, the current dredging is, is done in the next, I say as it started, they're, they're starting on the federal channel down harbor um, over the next two or three years. Um, Tom and I have sent a draft back and forth. Um, uh, John, I, 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 there's one typo that's sort of interesting on this. Uh, okay. And that is uh, one, two, three, four, that the NRA supports the current environment. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> so <laughs> perhaps adding a B to that would be. Uh, <laughs> that's a good idea. I'll look into that. <laughs> with your permission. You I think you know, I go ahead, Tom. Well, I, the one thing uh, uh, that I hadn't had it hadn't really appreciated uh, in my first run through on this is the fact that uh, Agnes's full report is out there, and I know you sent it to me, and somehow it got buried in the, you know, in the email somewhere. Uh, but uh, I need to sit down and look through all that again. I, I don't know. There's much more that we would add to this, but but uh, it, it is a. If any, if you all haven't seen that that report on black custard from uh, <laughs> Center for Coastal Coastal Studies, is out there, and it's, it's a really interesting document. So, John, Laura, have you the, last have you let, at least seen it? I've I've seen it. Yes. Yeah, but I was asking well, Laura and John what's. What's oh. on my mind is that the, the, that report was actually uh, sponsored by NRAB. And so uh, we have to, um, 
I've been trying to get a final invoice out of uh, the Center for Coastal Studies, which I haven't, <laughs> but, it, but I'm hoping I can get one by the, the last meeting and then we have to formally vote. Do we accept the report and therefore um, send a message to the town that the invoice should be paid? I looked through it. Um, so you've seen it, John. I have seen it. I, I honestly, it's not on the top of my mind right now. I don't want to try reading through it right now, but uh, that's okay. I'll, we'll, I, I need I'll look to get it onto our agenda. I've got it. Okay. Yeah, I so, think I think I think I've read it at one point too. Yeah, I mean, I think it it's fascinating. <laughs> the real problem, Tom, I think we have with this is. Um, uh, getting the concepts that we've talked about in this after dredging chapter accepted. I went, um, I can't remember if it was this spring or last fall, it must have been last fall, to the um, Marina Advisory Board. And I talked about this concept with them and I was, you know, very, people were very polite. Nobody said, what a ridiculous idea, what are you doing? But I, I could see the members of the committee just taking the, the, what I said and putting it aside and moving on. Um, pretty clear that they didn't, they, they weren't gonna take it up there is a dredging um, task force, which is headed by um, uh, one of the one of the previous chairman of the select board, um, whose name I now forget. Came came before Janet. I should know because he lives out near us. Um, well, so, I, you know, I've looked through some of their meeting minutes and it sounds like they're, you know, they're pretty much, uh, they're focused on what they're doing right now, it seems. And, right. Uh, I, I, I know that the, uh, the harbor master, um, Mike Flanagan was in, was sort of supportive of the idea, but um, he's about to retire and I, I so maybe I ought to start by going and talking to the, the new harbor master. Um, but I think the main, the main concern I have about this chapter is how is to be, how to phrase it, how to write it, um, how to, so it, it's promotable. Uh, I think the, I think the ideas are important and I'd hate, I'd hate to see in the future black mayonnaise just taken out into the, into Wellfleet Harbor and dumped. Not Wellfleet Harbor, it's um, Cape Cod Bay. Mm -hmm. All of that uh, aside and given the one um, correction that Tom noticed, is there any other comment on this chapter? I guess the sort of comment I'm, I'm is, is it clear and does it sort of make a case for future work. I think that's what we have to work on. I think it's good so far. I think it will help us when it's all put together and we take kind of a final read through for. Yeah. Let me go see if I can talk to, to the, the harbor master about, about, about this. Um, let him begin to think, be, begin to think about it. Who's the, who is the new harbor master? Uh, will somebody or other, it's not someone I know, um, which is, which is too bad because Mike and I have known each other for 15 years and uh, it, it's always a problem when someone you've worked with for 15 years disappears and Got to sort of start over, but I'm, I can do that. Shell fishing. 
my suggestion in reading the notes that we have for our, our, our meetings with the Shellfish Advisory Board, I'll go, I'll go and find Tom's, is that basically we, we take some of the concepts that are in those notes and just write them up into something um, that flows, so to speak. Uh, I had a, a couple of other notes of things that I would like to uh, talk more about. One is um, eelgrass and bay scallops. Had uh, a couple of things sort of drive me in, in that direction, um, more than a couple of things. Base, base scallops are at the moment plentiful and they're profitable. So that's good for shell fishermen. I've always want, I've never understood why eelgrass isn't, which is the habitat for, for the breeding habitat for bay scallops, isn't in Wellfleet Harbor. I think it ought to be. About 10 years ago, I was kayaking up on the Herring River, just north of the dike, not, not in the harbor itself, but in the river, um, about 100 yards up from the, from the dike, and there were some eelgrass growing. It didn't look very happy, but it was growing. And I know there's widgeon grass in, um, in the gut area. So it's, it's possible to consider both there and um, down along, Jer along Jer the inside of Jeremy Point to think about um, growing eelgrass. Uh, there's a reference in the 2007 shellfi shellfishing plan that in the mid 90s, uh, Robert Wallace did a, a study in which he was able to get the town to prohibit uh, uh, not dredging, um, dragging, dragging, thank you, for shellfish uh, over by Jeremy Point and eelgrass appeared, plus mm -hmm. lots of, lots of uh, bay scallops. So I think that's something we could talk about um, as a positive. Uh, a negative is that um, as sea level rise, we may get a lot of the of the grants um, flooded. And I was thinking particularly about these, this, these new grants we, we purchased from the How Do You Like Them Apples group, because inland from there, there's a lot of revetments. And so if there are a lot of revetments and sea level rise, um, there's nowhere for the uh, extra tide to go and so it's going to start to turn that area more into a lake than a, um, a, a series of tidal flats. So uh, don't know what to do about that but it seems to me that some of the technology for aquaculture is going to have to have to change to more more boat oriented rather than um, uh, vehicle oriented. Um, we've talked about oyster reefs um, I don't have any particular ideas. I would just go with those notes and turn it into something. Um, someone willing to take the charge of that? I'll work on it. I've got a lot going though. I, I just will warn you of that. <laughs> okay. Um, John, you had it in a, if, if you're, you're if you're fiddling with something though, if you can send me that, that would be great. You talking to me, John? Yes, yes. Yeah, John, I do. John D. I, I uh, also one thought I had about the, the the concept you're talking about the revetments in that field point we're talking about uh, turning into a lake. Uh, that might be a good opportunity for an oyster reef if it does in fact turn into with climate change that you're not going to have flats there anymore. And that would provide an opportunity for people to pick oysters like they do elsewhere, which is you dive down to get them. You know, either by hand, you, without dragging, 
Um, if you had an oyster reef, oysters would be plentiful there. And uh, it's one idea to, uh, to help with things. That, that's kind of, I just thought about that one day and I said, all right, maybe that's a possibility. But I think eventually with those revetments along Field Point, I think you're right. I think it's going to turn into a situation where the tide's not going to go out nearly like it used to. A long ways off, but eventually that's probably what's going to happen. I, one of the thoughts I had, John, is uh, we should go figure out how they um, take oysters out of uh, Chesapeake Bay because that's, that's a... Um, that's a big oyster growing region. It's all deep water. Same with Long Island Sound, I think, too. Yes, Long Island Sound also. So um, I, I think we should learn from what uh, other people do. So the idea of doing vertical, you know, stacked where you have, I don't know what the order would be, but you have mussels on the bottom, scallops somewhere, and clams and oysters on a, with a buoy at the top. Um, that's a way to do it in the deep water. Um, I believe we've had discussions about that at the Shellfish Advisory Board and the problem is water quality when you do something like that uh, around the area. So I don't know if that's feasible, but that's another, I know that's what there, there's some, at least one person doing that in Long Island Sound where that's, he, he trans, transitioned from fishing for cod and whatever he used to catch in his fishing boat to doing that stacked system of shell fishing. Well, um, Laura, I'd, I'd like to, as we think about our next meeting, um, what's the date today? The 8th the of 8th. October. Um, say three weeks from now or less, is, is that reasonable? Um, I can certainly do early November. I've got huge deliverables at work for November 1st, um, which is yeah, right. and everything else. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll try, John, but okay. Um, and then I'll send them to John D. I'll, I'll try. We're, you know, again, we're going to be meeting with the Shellfish Advisory Board, I believe, this week. And when we do, I'll bring up the topic and see what we, what I could get from them in terms of a suggestion. If there's anything I should be talking to the Shellfish Advisory Board about this chapter, it would be helpful to know about it before our meeting this week. I just, you know, so maybe Laura, you and I could speak about that. Yeah. I wouldn't mind sitting. I guess. I guess what what I'm what I'm going to suggest, John and, and Laura, is that the two of you work on the sh on the shell fishing chapter. Um, I, Just as an aside, yeah. I mean, uh, certainly um, when it comes to the shellfish advisory board, too. I know that we're we're looking for members. If anybody knows anybody that's keen on shell fishing, whether or not they're a, it's their employment or whether they love to shell fish, uh, we're looking for members over there. Well, I'm already on three committees and I, only about two too many, so. That's exactly the way I feel about it too. And uh, so Dave Seitler resigned, so he's no longer a member of the board. We've, we've had an open alternate position for a while now. So, uh, yeah, we'll be electing a new chair and we'll be electing a new secretary this week, I guess. Okay. Um, John, I think it would be most efficient. I know you've done a lot of thinking and work on the, on the Curley Report, which is the next, chap the next chapter along. Mm -hmm. um, I had some I had some thoughts about that. I I think if if you agree, I'll take a, a shot at that. That's a, a short to me it's a shorter, easier chapter than the shell fishing. Let you and Laura work on the shell fishing. And we'll we'll try to set up a meeting in early November. Um, 
I don't know if we should set up the meeting before or after election day. It depends on how we think things are going to work. <laughs> but I guess I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I shouldn't make political uh, comments. Um, but why don't we? Why don't we leave it like that? We, we've got some. We've got some notes from our meetings with the Shellfish Advisory Board. We've had some discussion on a couple other topics. Um, I'll, I'll try to be sure that those appear in the in a draft minutes up uh, right about this morning's meeting and we'll, we'll go from there. On the, John, on the Curley report, um, I know you've had trouble getting hold of uh, Owen, but as I, as I read what the old report is, I think it's, at least for me, not that difficult to, to put, get, put together a proposal for a renewal of it. Um, for our select board you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the old Curley report has a chapter on physical and chemical characteristics, but the Center for Coastal Studies is already doing that. And then we, there's a chapter about fin fish, which talks both about small fish like mummachog and bigger fish and lays out sampling methods and sampling locations. Mm -hmm. um, there's a discussion about marine vegetation and marsh life, some of which we'll cover in other chapters. The one thing, John, that I would concern me is um, the shellfish chapter. And I think we've got a merge on a meeting. Yeah. And the thing about the shellfish chapter is that when the Curley report was done, there was no aquaculture. And so that they, they had locations for sampling in many areas where today there is aquaculture. That's true. And what I think is important is to sample in places where there are just wild shellfish, because this is about not about the health of the aquaculture business, which the Shellfish Advisory Board is concerned with, but with this, the health of the harbor. And well, so my, um, my thinking is that you, you go down to um, the estuary of Fresh Brook, which is between Lieutenant Island and the Audubon. There's no, there's no aquaculture in that. You go over on the west side, there's no aquaculture. Um, I wanted to look and see what was planned for the Herring River restoration because there's, there's a lot of shell fishing as you get close to the dike, but then the area near the dike is, is forbidden and that there should be a, it'd be interesting to see what effect the restoration has on that. Um, the best I don't know what, to, I don't know what right, to, right now that area is loaded with big oysters is what's happening now. Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to all be moved. They can all be moved around the harbor now to clean out, you know, uh, to purify them. But uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see. When it comes to the aquaculture, uh, I don't think you can just leave it alone. I think that there's studying that needs to be done. And that's a part of the harbor now, so it's going to need to be studied as part of our Curley report follow-up. Okay. Well, it's certainly it's 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 very important because a lot of a lot of the, the the spat across the harbor comes from aquaculture. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think in terms of monitoring, let me write something up and see how it looks. But I think I think we we want to pick places where we know they're just wild shellfish. I had some other thought cruising through. Oh yes, um, there is um, uh, 
trawling for um, um, shellfish, dragging, I guess I would say. And um, I need to, uh, maybe we need to talk to Nancy about this, but uh, there's important shellfish populations in the deep water. And if we're going to see how well they're doing, uh, we need to be able to go to areas where there hasn't been recent dragging because, um, and I don't know if that's something that's manageable. I don't know if it's uh, possible to set aside for two or three years an area in the, that's normally dragged and say, well, don't drag here so we can do a, a study. Um, that may be a hard sell. Yeah, it's problematic. Yeah, that's what I think. So I think in terms of, sh of shell fishing, it, I, it may be difficult to reproduce what was uh, achieved in the previous uh, Curly report. But for the rest of it, I think there's a fairly straightforward path just to go where Curly went and, and repeat it, even though it's, it's uh, nearly 50 years old now. Well, so writing a chapter for the Harbor Management Plan about the Curly Report is different than actually having a new Curly Report done. So yeah, what, we, what we would, what I think we would do is write something that could be used as an RFP, a, 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 a request for a proposal. Right. And hopefully the Center for Coastal Studies or, or some other groups would, uh, uh, pick up on that. Okay, well, along those lines, that's, uh, I thought that Owen was on the right track, Owen Nichols at the Center for Coastal Studies, right. he, he, he had a good vision of what we were looking for, more or less. Um, the problem has been uh, just follow through. And um, so, you know, who knows, maybe we'll hear back from him. But the question is, when it comes to Gordon Peabody or anybody else, I reached out to a contact I have at Pew and I'm waiting to hear back. Maybe there's another organization that would be uh, willing to pick up the ball and run with it when it comes to a recurring harbor study like Curly. Okay. And maybe, I think, there's, I think maybe the there's somebody else at the Center for Coastal Studies, but I mean, he's on the right track, but the problem is, like everybody else, sometimes people are just on Cape Cod time out here, and we're having a hard time getting a uh, a finalized vision of what it's going to look like. Okay, I think we should write something that looks like an RFP and okay, and go 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 from there. And I said the big the big concern I have is to what extent we can reproduce the shell fishing part of the Curly report for the reasons I, I suggested. Now, I hope no one interprets that as um, being a concern about shell fishing in the harbor right now. I think it's very healthy. But the reason for doing the Curly Report is, is redoing it is sort of to confirm that in a unbiased way. Mm -hmm. The last chapter that we've, we've talked about is having to do with ac access summary. And I'm on the new committee, which is the rights of public access. So uh, on the basis of both committees, I was going to have a go at that. How's that committee doing? Um, it's with some good people on it. Uh, it It turns out to be harder than you think because when the, the, the trouble with, pub, with public access is there's all kinds of public access around, but people, when they think of, of access to, to beaches and um, the harbor, they think of driving and parking. And it's always the driving and parking, which is a problem. So we're spending some time looking at what's happening at the southwest corner of Lieutenant Island. Lots of people go there for um, 
beaching in the summer and there's nowhere to park. So you find people parking on the salt marsh, which is not a good thing. Um, and it's not clear that there's a simple solution to that. Uh, same thing happened when we, when we were talking about um, Duck Pond. We were concerned about maintaining the water purity of Duck Pond. Um, well, the problem was that there were lots of people going and parking. Um, so we, we, we tried to control that. I, I haven't been up to Duck Pond for a while, so I don't know to what extent we were successful. John, um, sorry to interrupt, but um, Ms. Ahern has had her hand up for a little bit. If you wanted me to recognize her, I can unmute her. Uh, I, I didn't see that. I was about to call on her because I saw she was here. But so how, how do I let her in? She, she's, she's in. Um, sh she's going to go ahead and ask her question now. OK. Thank you. Uh, do, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for your uh, activities on the public access. I've been following that, too. Um, one thing I'd like to say is you're right in that there are lots of moving parts to this whole climate change thing, but what can be really helpful for the public and I think anyone on these committees is to therefore be very specific about the documents you're looking at because in the, there's so many different maps and reports that we've paid a lot of money for that that's one central document place everyone needs to be going to. And some committees are better than others. So I just encourage you to do that. You mentioned a 2007 study about eelgrass and not dragging in the harbor. You know, that's an important one. So, and also Will Sullivan has been the assistant harbor master for quite some time. So it's not like he's starting from scratch. And um, I just, I live on Pleasant Point and Nancy just came down with her patrol and I asked her if she was going to listen to this meeting and she said she might, she might not, she might not have time. So I will just say that I am a busy person and people accuse me of having nothing better to do. But the reason why I started becoming involved in town politics was because I saw Wild Picker pulled off the flats right here. Uh, by the police being told that it was their job now. And that was instigated by a homeowner out on Old Wharf that the police would never reveal the identity of. So on top of all that, I'm an appraiser and I am very critical of the Hidla appraisal, which does not mention climate change at all. Access was guaranteed to Kathleen Bacon in the executive session minutes that I had to fight for their release of. Didn't get them till December. I've written to the appraiser. I've said, did Nancy discuss this with you? Did you refer to these reports? Nothing. So what the town has done by purchasing Hitler with taxpayer money is opened up all of these issues. You, uh, in the news, you know, we were seeing it as shellfish stuff. The rest of the country was seeing it as, you know, public space to kayak, to enjoy, just like it was sold to us. And lastly, as far as the surveys, apparently there are two. One was used for the fake appraisal, as I call it, to justify the $2 million spent. And the other was used to register with the Registry of Deeds. And I understand that Nancy's out there now telling people to move their grants. So there are lots of issues and I don't know if another committee is gonna solve it, but one big first step is that we're all on the same page and that appraisal and the, the, the fact that it was, didn't describe the subject property that we bought is going to be ultimately the issue because when these homeowners associations want compensation for these, these trails there or whatever, they're going to look to the value of that appraisal. And it's, it's irrelevant. We overpaid. That's all I have to say. And I am a certified appraiser and I'm happy to answer anyone's questions because the town ignores me and the appraiser ignores me. And I now have to go to the appraisal foundation in Washington, DC. So I'm going to mute myself right now. Uh, Jude, before you do that, um... Uh, can you put yourself on camera so that if uh, if we meet again, I'll know who you are. 
I'd rather not since I rolled out of bed this morning and was okay. driving here. I'm sorry, I'm just, I will, uh, I'll send you a picture by email. I understand. I understand. Better than I do, don't worry you know, about it. You can also look at the March 10th meeting wherein I drove from New York to, to about this open meeting law, about the Hitler purchase, and the cops almost took me away. That's a great one. I'll send you that clip so everyone knows who I am. Okay, great. Three points. Um, you, you had a point about giving people uh, sufficient background about climate change, sea level rise. I agree with that. Um, I've got a fairly long stack of potential uh, references and um, graphs that, that I could use. Uh, I, I appreciate that my problem is I've been reading about this for, for several years, so um, there's a risk of my just taking it uh, for granted that people know what it is. So I think you've made a good point there. About access questions, do you know um, Jim Falcone? Yes, he's an excellent chair. Yes, he is. And I'm pleased to be working with him. Um, it would be best now if you have any specific concerns or observations about um, lack of respect for citizen access or shellfish access to, to, to contact Jim. Um, so please do that. And I'm sure he'll put it before the committee. The, um, Last point is about uh, how do you like them apples sale? Uh, we were never directly involved in that. Um, maybe we should have been. Yes, a year <laughs> but, ago before we bought it. But uh, yeah. how should I say? I'm not sure if at that time, um, even my thinking about the effects of, on on the harbor. Uh, a year ago, was, you was, didn't think about climate change and rising sea level. That's not true. It was purposely left out of this appraisal. Well, um, if, if we were deficient, our bad, but that's, but here's the that's thing. what happened. It's not worth it if you can't get to it. And that's sure. why we overpaid. And the implications statewide are huge. And so, there may be nothing we can do about it, but we have to point this out because that appraiser does real estate appraisals all over the state, and I do not think it's correct, and nobody will listen to me. Yeah. Well, I will, I will certainly, there will certainly be a concern about the effect of sea level, try that again, sea level rise on access. Um, both for shell fishermen and for um, the layperson, so to speak. So that, in that, in that sense, um, maybe we can help. Thank you for your comments. Back to the members of the committee. Is there anything else that we want to um, talk about today? apart from setting a date maybe for the next meeting. Uh, listening to Laura, I, I would be thinking about um, early in November. It's the election day is the third, so... Uh, I'd he I hesitate to have a meeting on the, on the third because we need Courtney's support, and she may be fairly busy then. So, Tom, Laura, would it be all right to have a meeting toward the end of the week before election day? Mm -hmm. I, I'd rather not let it drag. I, I'm, I'm hoping to get this thing before the select board in December. So, um, we, we sort of got to speed things up a bit. Is, is that reasonable? Or do you need, do you need, you're going to need that weekend? Laura, are you still there? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I was just looking at my calendar. Oh, okay. That's right. So are you 
What dates are you are you thinking? Well, so the, I, I don't want. What I'm thinking is that we would have two meetings in November. One, one either late October or very early November. The other, well before Thanksgiving, and I would like to be in a position at that meeting well before Thanksgiving that we pretty much have something final that I could uh, put together as a booklet, um, get online and uh, get to the select board um, uh, before Christmas. Part of my thinking is very selfish because af after the first of the year, um, Linda and I are likely off to Arizona, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise, as they say. Because uh, we're concerned about how to get there and we're concerned about what we find when we do get there. Yeah. Well, the week of, so the 11th, the 11th and 12th is a Wednesday and a Thursday and... 11th and 12th of what? Of November. Okay, well, I think I mean, if, the, if we if we meet the the week of election, then we need a couple of weeks before we get back together again. So, late that right. week or first thing the week after would do. Well, so the fifth is a Thursday. That's two days after the election. I mean, I I don't really know what the election's got to do with our meeting, but the following week is the week of the you know. I'm good on the fifth. The fifth. All right. I've got nothing going on the fifth. Sounds okay for me. That's I wasn't, no, I know the election doesn't directly affect us. It's just our state of mind. That's all. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm hopefully yeah, we're all going to be happy in the fifth. Okay. <laughs> we'll set something up for the fifth. Is it, is it, is, I like this early morning, um, early yes. this morning. Is that best for everyone? Yes. This sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So. You're going to circulate an, an agenda for that meeting, John? Well, I will about a week ahead of time, but basically it's to go over this. All right. Because I, I'm sure by then I'll have some kind of something going on with the curly report follow-up. Okay. Well, as I said, I'll, I'll, I'll write a draft chapter and then we, we can build on that. All right. So, um, let's see. The, People seem to like the introduction, climate change. I need to talk to Gordon and it needs more, as Jude was saying, more details. Uh, dredging, we all need to look at it in terms of a, a sales job. Um, shellfishing, Laura and John. I'll, I'll do a chapter on the Curly Report and access summary. Should be fun. Anything else, guys? Are we talking about dragging? Was that going to be part of it? Not dredging, but dragging? I got to take Only in the context of the Curly report. Yes. I'm okay. Um, because if we're trying to monitor the wild population in the harbor, uh, we need to work where the draggers go as well as along the, 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 the flats which don't have aquaculture. But it does, it wouldn't do us any good to take a sample from some particular place and then we come back um, five years later, ten years later and find it, it all that's happened has been a lot of dragging there, which is fine. People make money off of it, but it doesn't, it doesn't give us a way to get the data we want. So, well, and we're a natural resources advisory board, so I'm thinking that dragging and its relation to eelgrass maybe should be discussed again. Well, that, as I said, this this the, this reference to the work that um, oh, those, those Robert are... Wallace did. Everyone knows him as Bobby Wallace, but I don't really know him, so I call him Robert Wallace in the mid <laughs> mid 1990s. Um, was done on behalf of the, the shellfish community. So, I mean, there's a precedent. And the other, um, the fact that people recognize that 
our base scallops are doing well and there's a lot of money, that's another, that's another incentive. So if we, if we could re repeat that experiment and show that we got uh, eelgrass into the harbor and um, more base scallops, well, that would be, that should be, that should be a benefit to the shellfish community. I'll put together some, some notes, try to do that today uh, or tomorrow and uh, while it's fresh in mind. But if there's nothing else, um, look forward to our next meeting on November 5th. So a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Thank you all. And um, thanks, John. We'll be in touch. Thanks, John. Okay. So, um,